Grab your models of the universe, Wargamers. Today, we're taking a look at the natural order of role-playing games and or RPGs. But, of course, they're really just two sides of the same coin, aren't they? And we're coming to you live from a pleasant light sprinkling rain here at the beach. Maybe we'll get a squall moving through so we can have that soothing natural sound of the rainfall that will help us maintain our cool as we deal with what is shockingly a rather controversial topic, and that is how to approach tabletop games. Role-playing games such as the big mamma jamma Dungeons and Dragons, and of course tabletop uh, war games as well, and really you want to approach them from the same perspective. We'll get into this in a little more detail. We are going to change your mindset. We're advocating for a whole new approach. Well, it's not really a new approach. It's an old approach that has been lost to the wayside. A few guys are doing that here and there, no doubt, but this is not the general consensus. We're going to shift from a Copernican model to a, I think it's called Galilean model. You know, where you, where the, the universe, instead of the earth being at the center of the universe, the sun is, instead of you being at the center of the gaming universe, we're going to put the rules at the center of the gaming universe. The modern mindset, the modern paradigm for games these days is that we have to take care of the players first. What do you guys want? And the characters first. Well, how do we design a game? You know, the characters got to come first. And, and it doesn't even matter if you design a game because all of the stuff that you've designed, all of those rules and all of the accoutrements, all of those go straight out the window because the characters have to come first. And the players have to come first. The thinking being that players are the basic building blocks of the game, and if you don't take care of the players, then none of the rest of it matters. Although, given that you've said the rules don't matter, I'm not sure why you would think any of it matters anyway. The model that we're going to take a look at today is, as specified by Gary Gygax himself, a model that says... You need to put the rules first, and then the campaign, and then the characters third. Not last, but third. That is a very controversial take. But here it is, right from the DMG. This is the natural order of things. And as you know, when it comes to the world and the universe in which we live, you have two options. You can accept and embrace the natural order of things. You can work with them. And if you do, you will achieve great results. Or you can swim upstream. It's a lot harder to do that, but it doesn't work nearly as well. It might seem counterintuitive, uh, particularly from a guy like me, but that's just the way the universe works. There is a natural law to things. And if you approach things in in obedience to the natural law, then you're going to have a much easier time with things. And Gary Gygax, right out of the gate, man, he hit a grand slam right out of the park. This is the order that makes the most sense. It seems a little counterintuitive. If I put the characters last, how is that going to be what's best for them? Here's how it works. These three items are not actually as discreet as this quote makes them out to be. They are a tripod, if you will. They support each other. But if you put, the way this works is that if you put the characters first, you haven't laid the proper foundation. You have a cloud castle that is floating on nothing and doesn't really provide what you hope it provides. Don't build a cloud castle. You need to establish a firm foundation first. Let me pause right here to interject a little thought. For some reason, some of you guys get all bound up with this. You have my permission to play these games wrong. It's okay if you play these wrong. You can even enjoy doing it wrong. That's fine. I don't know why we got to say this every time, but people get really mad when you don't. So, in nomine patres, Ephilius Spiritus Sancti, you have my blessing. Go be wrong. It's fine. As we've talked about in previous videos, the, f the rules are that foundation. They are 
the Big Bang from which everything else flows. And a well-written rule set will inform the campaign world itself. In fact, in many cases, the rules are a way of building the campaign. Essentially, the campaign is inherent in the rules that are designed. In a game like AD&D, the cosmology and the rules of the game build that cosmology, and the cosmology then reinforces the domain level play. That is, when you're dealing with movers and shakers and powers that be, that The rules of the cosmology inform the campaign world, and because the characters live in the campaign world, if you don't have a breathing campaign, then the characters are just discrete, atomized individuals floating in a sea of nothing. A lot of people have tried to solve this conundrum by discussing things like spotlight time, and it just it doesn't work very well because if you're trying to take care of the character first then you wind up having to shoehorn all kinds of oddities into the campaign world that don't work this is very closely related to the last video where we talked about timekeeping and how to use what we've taken to calling Jeffrogaxian time or one to one time where one day passes in the campaign for every one day that passes in the real world when you're not sitting at the table right I warned you, these things are all very closely connected. We're building a web here. We're building a structure with flying buttresses that support each other. And those flying buttresses will allow us to build a grand cathedral of RPGs. This buttress of one-to-one time forces you as a player to accept that you are not the most important person sitting at the table, that all of you are members of a symphony working together to create this beautiful sound. The, the, the GM is a bit of a conductor, but he is the conductor of maybe perhaps a, a jazz trio would be a better example where you can't dominate the sound. All you can do is inform the sound and you need to know when to step forward and when to step back. Sometimes you'll have a session where it doesn't feel like you're doing a whole lot. And then you jump in on the downtime and say, here's how I'm going to influence the campaign. The point being that in practice, if you step back, and put less emphasis on the character, more emphasis on the campaign. Oh, I should finish the thought. The one-to-one timekeeping comes into play here because now you don't have a character. You have several characters. You, as a player, don't have a goal for your character. You have multiple characters who have multiple goals, all of which play an integral role in building and operating the campaign as a whole. So in this way, when you put the campaign first in your thinking, then the characters will flow naturally from that. And as the campaign grows, NPCs will show up that will make for better characters. And now you to look at an NPC, oh, he's the lord of this castle way out in the hinterlands who's going to be doing who's going to be playing a role now, he's got potential units that may influence the game in one way or another. That's not my character. However, this is our campaign. And by taking the reins of this character for a session or two, I, as a player, will be able to help build and, you know, nurture the seed of this campaign. So by stepping back, and it may be counterintuitive, But if you stop to think about it, by stepping back from the role of a single individual participant and looking at the campaign as a whole, you can have much greater and more profound effects on the game that you are playing. It's a very different kind of game than the modern style of role-playing game, but it is just as entertaining, if not more so. In fact, because you are embracing the rules as they're written and the campaign world as it's presented, you're no longer swimming upstream. You'll find that by making, by flipping that little switch in how you approach the game, everything changes. I give you, and, and the same thing is true for that step from rules to campaign. When you embrace the rules, as we discussed in our Rule Zero video, when you embrace the rules, 
and don't try to short circuit them because they're difficult or because, well, I don't like having to achieve, having to overcome that challenge. When you embrace the rules, what you find is that the world, the campaign world itself will begin to change and it will begin to align itself with the foundation of those rules. And you won't have to find yourself trying to fit square pegs into round holes because it all fits together as a seamless whole. I'll give you an example of this. And and what you find is that um, by finding rules that you don't fully understand or you haven't completely incorporated, you can make for a richer world. The example that I have in mind is uh, a one-off campaign where your humble host took the role of a paladin. He was a one-off character. And and at the time, I wasn't very familiar with the unarmed combat rules in AD&D. Everyone at the table was vaguely familiar with it. So at the very first opportunity, my character said, that's what I'm doing. There was a, a demon lady, a demon witch showed up. She was alone. We're going to grapple. And everybody went, oh, jeez. Now we got to break out the rules and the game is going to grind to a halt as we read the rules and explore how these work. Well, hold on. See, that's the wrong mindset. The game is not grinding to a halt. All we've done is shift the focus from one challenge. We got to beat this demon witch to a different challenge. We got to beat our misunderstanding of these rules. So while it took some time to resolve this one on one combat, we discovered something very important. Don't send your big bad evil guy into a situation without plenty of backup. Because in a one-on-one situation, a first-level paladin can take out a powerful demon witch just by putting her in a chokehold and going full UFC on her. In fact, what happened subsequently is that the characters, the other players realized that this was a viable tactic for them as well. One of them hired four sumo wrestlers, unarmed guys, to wander around with him to make sure that nobody grappled him. And if they ran into four other guys, they could grapple, tie him up. Even a losing grapple could tie him up. The trick is, in AD&D, it turns out, always have some minions around. Because if you're stuck in a one-on-one grappling situation and there's a second person on your side nearby, then the two-on-one is going to dominate. Oh, great. Paladin, you just wrestled that demon witch? Well, her kobold hireling, her kobold minion, has a spear, and he's going to gut you. He's going to stab you in the kidney with a spear over and over, and you're virtually defenseless because you're all busy hogtying the demon witch. Right? So this is an example of how you embrace the rules, even the hard ones. And it changes the campaign framework, and suddenly by changing the campaign to one where grappling is a very real threat to singular characters, PCs or NPCs, the player characters now have revised their understanding of the world and their approach to the game, and because it's a tactic that always lives in the back of your mind, it adds to the richness and the completeness of the game. Another example of this process at work is a campaign that I read about online where a DM was having very real trouble because his characters, excuse me, his players kept buying dogs, war dogs, to send them in as disposable minions. He wanted to know how to counteract that. And the answer is, well, let's take a look at the rules. Are you using morale rules? Are you using the animal intellect rules? These are not just sacks of hit points that the players can shove around at will. These are discrete bits of the rule set that if you follow the rules, if you use the availability of henchmen and hirelings and animal companions, the local village runs out of dogs real quick. If you're using one-to-one timekeeping, then you can say, yeah, this village probably has about eight dogs that are available and trained and ready to do this. Heck, even a major metropolitan area is not going to have a whole lot of war dogs trained up. Oh, yeah, there's six of them available. Oh, you burn through the six of them. Well, guess what? It's going to take another six months for the next litter of puppies to be fully trained. And now that there's a shortage, they're going to cost three times as much. By embracing the rules, you inform the campaign 
And now the characters are going to be taken care of. They can still get dogs, but they might have to import them. That's going to take some time. All of these things are very, I don't want to say complicated, because if you just stop to think about them for a few minutes, they all flow naturally. But they only flow naturally if you start from the question of what are the rules, not what do my players need? Well, I, how would you phrase that question? What, what do I have to give my players? The answer to that question is nothing. You don't have to nothing, right? Or how do I redesign the world to allow the players to do this thing? Or how do I redesign the world to prevent the players from doing this thing? You don't have to. All you have to do is go back to the rules, see how it informs the rules, and then force the players to operate within that framework. And I would say denying players their their massive numbers of readily available minions, you're challenging them as players. They will grow by dint of having to adapt to the changing world and the world that changes simply because you're applying the rules as written. In conclusion, and we're only going to have one this time, the proper order of things is rules, then the campaign that arises from those rules, and then take care of the individual characters that sprout from those rules. And if you use this natural Gygaxian order of things, you will find that your players are well taken care of. And a host of metagame issues, spotlight time, challenge ratings, all of these things vanish. We are involved with a hobby where a host of people have decided that what you need to do is change the rules to suit the players, and then all kinds of knock-on effects rise up, these problems rear their head. Whereas, if you just played the rules as written, they would all resolve themselves. And I guess I do have one more conclusion just as a reminder, what we do at the table informs what we do out here in the real world. And so if you are playing the rules and it doesn't work out very well, it's okay. That doesn't mean that you failed. All right, you failed at that one little task. But remember that every failure is one step closer to success. If, you're, if you tr in, try to run the rules as written and it fails, that's all right. You get them next time. If your campaign doesn't map to the rules properly and your characters are dying way too much because you're not using things like morale, that's okay. Go back. Look at what you're doing wrong. You can fix it. And then you can get one step closer to being right. And if you do that, you won't have to spend another 40 years playing the game wrong without understanding why you always have that nagging feeling that this just isn't right. You embrace the, this just isn't right. And you understand that that feeling, if you approach it from a healthy attitude and with a proper order, that feeling of wrongness means you're doing something wrong. But now you have a better route to doing it right. Failure is one step on the route to success. So go forth, try to play these games as written. And if you fail, you're still doing better than the people that embrace playing them wrong. Till next time, this is Mr. Wargaming. I'm praying for you.